Good evening and welcome to our Sunday evening worship. We are so glad you decided to join with us online. This evening we will have songs from In Search of the Lord's Way. The words will be on the screen and we encourage everybody to sing along. We will also be led in prayer by a couple of men here from Sawa Road and sharing a message from God's Word from Mr. Gary. As we begin this evening, let's go to God in prayer. Our most kind and gracious Heavenly Father, we thank you to the Lord for this day and for all that you do. The Lord, help us at this time to the Lord to focus our minds and our hearts on you, dear Lord, and give you our full attention. Lord, we ask you to be with those that are sick and those that are hurting, dear Lord, and if it be your will, dear Lord, to please heal them. Lord, we ask you to be with those that are grieving the loss of the loved one, dear Lord, and please bring the comfort that only you can, dear Lord. Lord, help us as Christians to reach out to our brothers and sisters in Christ, dear Lord, and be them for, the, for them in their time of need. Lord, we ask you to be with our world, be with our nation, dear Lord, as we continue to battle this virus, dear Lord, to continue to be with the doctors and the nurses and all those that are working so hard on the front lines, dear Lord, and keep everyone safe, dear Lord, and if it be your will, please take this virus far from us. Lord, just continue to be with your church, dear Lord, and give us the boldness and the courage that everywhere we may, we may go, dear Lord, that we may proclaim the gospel, dear Lord. That, Lord, some may come to the knowledge of you and to, to obey, obey your word, dear Lord. Lord, just God, God protect us, and in Christ's name we pray. Amen.
Hello. Have you ever thought of trouble as being good? I'd have to respond and say, mm, that really wouldn't be my first thought. <laughs> trouble, that's trouble. And who wants to have trouble? And certainly, who would think of it as being good? And yet, James sees blessings in afflictions. It's important for us to look at this little book of James and realize just how practical it is for everyday Christian living. He deals with so many of the things that you and I deal with on a daily basis. And you'd have to admit, though none of us likes it, that trouble is one of those things. So James begins his little book by saying, a slave brother sees blessings in trials. Now, listen to his introduction because it's, it's remarkable given what we know about his earlier life. James, a bondservant of God and of the Lord Jesus Christ, to the twelve tribes which are scattered abroad. Notice, James, a bondservant. Now, if you're like me, I don't use the word bondservant at all. It's just not a word with which I'm extremely familiar or even comfortable in using. But if you look it up, the idea is a slave. And look to whom he considered himself to be enslaved. He was a slave to God. Okay, well, that makes sense because after all, God is the creator. God is the one who sustains our lives. But then he also says that he is a slave to the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, when Jesus walked on the earth, James did not think of him in that way at all. In fact, James borderline thought he was crazy. He certainly didn't believe in him as the Son of God. But by now, as he writes this little book, he is describing him as the Lord Jesus Christ. In other words, Master, Savior, King. That's the way he views him. Probably that arose from the fact that he saw him after he was raised from the dead. Paul talks about that in 1 Corinthians chapter 15. All right, with all of that under consideration, notice next what he says to these scattered Christians around the world. Verse 2 of James chapter 1. My brethren, Count it all joy when you fall into various trials. He uses the word brethren, and by the way, that's not going to be the last time. In fact, in this book, James uses the word brother or some form of it 19 different times. It is evident that to James, family is very, very important, and it ought to be. In Hebrews chapter 2, verse 11, when the writer to the Hebrew Christians uh, talks about Jesus, among other things, he says, for both he who sanctifies and those who are being sanctified are all of one, for which reason he is not ashamed to call them brethren. He who sanctifies, that would be Jesus. He's the one that sets us apart for the service of God. And those who are being sanctified will be us, that is, all Christians, because we are the ones whose Jesus' blood sets apart. Now, why does James use the word brethren? The idea really is, ordinarily, of the same womb. We might put it a little differently and just say, of the same family, but both ideas go together very well. In John chapter 3, when Jesus sits down with Nicodemus, who came to him by night, he makes this statement in verse 5. Most assuredly, I say to you, unless one is born of water and of the Spirit, he cannot enter the kingdom of God. Born of water. He's obviously referring to the waters of baptism. 
Because in the waters of baptism, we contact the blood of Jesus. Who lets us know that? Who but the Spirit? The Spirit who speaks through inspired men, as Paul relates it in 1 Corinthians chapter 2. The Spirit who clearly lets us know that the old man of sin, the man who is dead in sin, is transformed in baptism and born anew, born to walk in newness of life. That's what Paul said, Romans chapter 6, verses 3 and 4. How did I then get to be the brother of Jesus Christ? How do you get to be the brother or sister of Jesus Christ? The answer is by listening to the words of the Spirit and being born of water, because therein I contact the death of Christ, where his blood was left for my cleansing. James immediately goes out of that uh, and talks about how we brethren are blessed when we fall into various trials. Now, first of all, let's think about that word fall into. Notice uh, the way he writes this. He says, when, not if. Everybody's going to eventually face trials. There's no doubt about that. Notice also, it's not something you go into seeking. It's not something you go forward seeking. Instead, you fall into it. And the word that James uses here is the same word that Jesus used in Luke chapter 10 when he told that parable of the Good Samaritan. You remember? There was a certain man who went down from Jerusalem to Jericho who fell in among thieves. Later translations don't quite say it that way. The thieves fell in on him. He didn't go looking for thieves. They came upon him. And in much the same way, James indicates that various trials, all types of trials, come into our lives, not because we're looking for them, but instead because they fall upon us. Why does James think that we ought to count it joy when that happens? Well, he answers that in verses 3 and 4 of James chapter 1 when he says, Knowing that the testing of your faith produces patience, but let patience have its perfect work, that you may be perfect and complete lacking nothing. In the margin of the New King James Version, in place of that word perfect, it has the word mature. We might say full grown. How do you get to be full grown in Christ? James says through patience. Uh, we might use a different word. We understand patience, but what about this? Steadfastness. Hang on, don't give up, no matter how many trials fall in upon you, just remain constant. It's reminiscent of what Paul told the Corinthian brethren in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 58. Therefore, my beloved brethren, be ye steadfast, unmovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord, for as much as you know that your labor is not in vain in the Lord. Why should we remain constant? Because we know that when we're working in the Lord, when we're living for the Lord, we have a reward that is coming, our own resurrection, which is possible for God, as we can see, because Jesus was raised from the dead. Now, what about this word mature? The writer to the Hebrew Christians in Hebrews chapter 5, verse 14, tells us how maturity comes about through that steadfastness. He explains it this way. But solid food belongs to those who are of full age, that is, those who by reason of use have their senses exercised to discern between good and evil. The point is obvious. The way we grow up is by facing tests. And as we face those tests, what we come to realize is this. We come to recognize right and wrong. 
we learn to differentiate between what God would want us to do and what God would not want us to do. And that's how we grow up. So, no wonder that James, as a slave brother, says us to see blessings in trials because they help us grow up. He goes immediate from that to something that I think is important. I mean, seeing blessings in trials is not easy. And so he next says, brothers, seek wisdom. Now, look at the very end of the fourth verse where he says when we endure these trials, when we remain steadfast in trials, we will be complete, perfect, mature, complete, lacking nothing. And I'm going to tell you something that I am afraid I do lack at times. And James goes immediately into that in verse 5 when he says, If any of you lacks wisdom, let him ask of God who gives to all liberally and without reproach, and it will be given him. This word wisdom describes really understanding. Look at the book of Proverbs, if you would. Proverbs chapter 1, the wise man opens uh, this great book of, of, of wise sayings in verse 2 of Proverbs 1 by saying, to know wisdom and instruction to perceive the words of understanding. Now, it's clear because he's merely restating what he says in the early part there with what he says in the second part. And so he equates wisdom and understanding. Look at verse 5, and we're going to confirm what we just said when he says a wise man will hear and increase learning. So we're talking about a wise man, but now watch and a man of understanding will attain wise counsel. The wise man and the man of understanding are both the same person. Wisdom and understanding are then ultimately the same thing. I need wisdom. I need understanding to appreciate what these trials in my life are about. And sometimes I really lack it. How am I going to get it? Well, James told us, ask God. Ask God. That reminds us, I think, or should at least, of a certain king, king by the name of Solomon, the wisest man who ever lived on the earth outside of the Lord himself. In 1 Kings chapter 3, we see Solomon having just been installed as the new king. He's been, he's been uh, given the crown now. And after he's received the crown, God comes to him, and he basically asks him, what do you want? And God didn't really put any limitations on that. Notice the answer that Solomon gives beginning at verse 6 of 1 Kings chapter 3. And Solomon said, You've shown great mercy to your servant David, my father, because he walked before you in truth, in righteousness, and in uprightness of heart with you. You have continued this great kindness for him, and you have given him a son to sit on his throne as it is this day. Now, O Lord my God, you have made your servant, king, instead of my father David. But I am a little child. I do not know how to go out or come in. And your servant is in the midst of your people, whom you have chosen, a great people, too numerous to be numbered or counted. Therefore, give to your servant an understanding heart to judge your people, that I may discern between good and evil. For who is able to judge this great people of yours? Solomon asked for wisdom. By the way, you know as well as I do, if you've read on in the text, that God was thrilled with this request. It demonstrated that Solomon had learned some things from his father. He appreciated the importance of leading God's people in the right way. And recognizing that, he wants God to give him the wisdom that it will take 
to differentiate between good and bad. Doesn't that sound familiar? Didn't we just read that in Hebrews chapter 5, verse 14? Well, that's exactly what Solomon wants, and God gives it to him. Of course, he gives him more because he asked for wisdom. We need to realize that when you ask God for wisdom, he will supply it. He will provide it. And not just wisdom, but he also is a liberal giver. So he's going to give us more than just wisdom. Listen to Paul as he writes to the uh, to well the brethren in Philippi. No, let's wait. We'll look at that again in just a minute. I'll talk about this extended idea. But think about the the wise man in Proverbs ten verse thirty one where he says, the mouth of the righteous springs forth wisdom, but the perverse tongue will be cut out. I want to be a wise man. I want to be someone who presents understanding, particularly of God's word. Trials ought to drive me to that if I ask God for the wisdom, the understanding to appreciate what's going on. Well, James continues in verse 6 at the beginning. When he says, but let him ask in faith with no doubting. Ask in faith. In other words, believe God. Trust God. You can trust God. He has always provided for his people. I cannot help but think about Jesus, who so often went to his father in prayer. And particularly, he went to him in prayer as he was approaching the time of his betrayal his trials, and his crucifixion. As Jesus approaches that, really, he doesn't want to go through that tremendous trial. And so he asks, if it's possible, let this cup pass from me. He prays that. But then he says, nevertheless, not my will, but thine be done. Listen to him, because he is clearly ready, ready to receive the, whatever the Lord will give him, whatever the Lord thinks is best, that's what I need to do as well. I need to pro- approach God in faith. In Hebrews chapter 11, verse 6, the writer to the Hebrew Christian says, But without faith it is impossible to please him. For he that cometh to God must believe that he is, and that he is a rewarder of those that diligently seek him. So, I need to ask God in faith. I need to believe that he will reward me if I diligently seek him. And I don't need to be a man who wavers. Listen to James as he continues. Let's just go back and reread the the sixth verse all the way through the eighth verse. And hear what he says. But let him ask in faith with no doubting. For he who doubts is like a wave of the sea driven and tossed by the wind. For let not that man suppose that he will receive anything from the Lord. He is a double-minded man, unstable in all his ways. Now, the description here is pretty powerful. The easiest way for me to imagine it is he's going from faith to doubt to faith to doubt, back and forth. And one author that I read said he's he's like a drunk man on on a boat that's being tossed in a in a, a stormy sea, and you can almost see him just staggering all around. He, he cannot get his footing anywhere. The man who approaches God, not really believing that God can or will answer, not trusting God to give a good answer, that man is like that staggering man who cannot get his feet. He will not receive a blessing from God because he does not trust him. So James urges us, brothers, seek wisdom. And then he notes, brothers have reason to boast. Now, again, think about the trials. What would you put in the category of trials? Well, I personally would easily put the idea of, of, of being of lowly estate. I would probably have a little bit harder time to put in that category a man with wealth. Is he really going through a trial? Well, listen, because James elaborates and says all brothers have a reason to boast. He begins 
in verse 9, saying, let the lowly brother glory in his exaltation. Literally, we'd be saying, let him be proud in, let him boast in, being lifted up on high, lifted up by the Lord. Look at Romans chapter 5, which is, of course, written to Christians in the, in the city of Rome. And listen to what Paul has to say to them, beginning at verse 1. Therefore, having been justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom also we have access by faith into this grace in which we stand and rejoice in the hope of the glory of God. We're set free. We're sanctified. That was the word we saw earlier. Set apart made as if we'd never sinned. That's justified. How? In Christ. And when that happens, what goes with it? It is clear what goes with it. We are exalted. We're lifted up. Our sins are forgiven. And we now are a part of the glorious body of Jesus Christ, the family of our God. So let the lowly brother boast in his exaltation. You know, along with that comes all kinds of blessings. I alluded to that earlier, tried briefly to turn here earlier, but let, let's do it now. Philippians chapter 4, verse 19, listen to Paul as he writes to the brethren of Philippi and gives them this simple assurance, and my God shall supply all your need according to his riches in glory by Christ Jesus. There's not anything that a Christian truly needs that will not be provided by the Lord. You might say, well, I don't have enough money to take care of all my needs. Well, you don't have to because God's going to see to your needs. Now, I underscore the word needs. I sometimes personally have confused wants with needs. We've got to be careful that we do not do that. We don't want to confuse wants with needs, but God's going to give us everything that we need. We, therefore, who might be of lowly estate, can boast because he exalts us. He lifts us up in Christ. But then there's a different trial that he talks about, and oddly enough, that trial is wealth. And that person, too, can boast. But listen to what James uh, has to say about it. Verse 10, the beginning. But the rich in his humiliation. All right, the poor man, the man of lowly estate, uh, is proud because he's been exalted in Christ. But the rich man? The rich man is proud, or ought to be, in his being brought low, in his humiliation. It reminds us a little bit of what Jesus said in the Sermon on the Mount in what we call the Beatitudes. Matthew chapter 5, look beginning at verse 3. Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Now stop just a minute. Poor in spirit. They recognize their spiritual poverty. A rich man who finds Jesus realizes that those riches are nothing in the spiritual realm. He's actually impoverished without the blood of Jesus. Then Jesus goes on. Blessed are those who mourn, for they shall be comforted. And this word mourn here is not the mourning for the, the death of a loved one, although I believe we can sustain that God cares about them too. Places like 2 Corinthians chapter 1 uh, indicate that very clearly. But here, the word mourn is the, is the tear of contrition the tear of sorrow for my sins. Not sorry that I'm caught, but sorry uh, because I have so hurt God by what I did. If I have that tear of contrition, good news is I'll be comforted. And then verse five, blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. Once I realize that I'm spiritually impoverished and that I've hurt God and I humble myself before him, he will give me wonderful blessings. So, there is a trial in riches, and the trial is, will you and I recognize in whatever riches we have, that really they amount to nothing. 
if we don't have Christ. James went on to explain it a little further at the end of verse 10 of James 1 and on into verse 11 when he said, Because as the flower of the field he will pass away, for no sooner has the sun risen with a burning heat than it withers the grass. Its flower falls and its beautiful appearance perishes. So the rich man also will fade away in his pursuits. The message is strong and it is evident. That is, earthly wealth won't last. I mean, it won't last at all. I mean, think about it. Name off the richest people that you know. And it, it's most of them right now, I guess, are, are moguls in, in, the, in the tech industry. Think about all those fellas and those women that have all that wealth. What can you say for sure about them, that wealth? They're not going to keep it. Oh, they might keep it the rest of their life on earth but they're not going to keep it once they die. Somebody else is going to take that money and no telling what they will do with it. We need to remember what the Lord said further in the Sermon on the Mount, Matthew chapter 6, beginning verse 19, when he said, Lay not up for yourselves treasures upon earth, where moth and rust doth corrupt, and where thieves do break through and steal, but lay up for yourselves treasures in heaven. Where neither moth nor rust hath corrupt, and where thieves do not break through nor steal. For where your treasure is, there will your heart be also. If we put our treasure in heaven, then earthly wealth won't, won't really matter. We can use it to the glory of God, sure. But it won't matter because what really matters is heaven. James causes us to realize that, that brothers see blessings in affliction. He started off by portraying himself as a, a slave brother. And he said he saw blessings in trials of all things. And he demonstrated why and how. It's the means of our growing up in the Lord. But to fully understand it and appreciate it, I need to seek wisdom. And James said that. And having sought wisdom, I need to be ready to rejoice. If I'm a person that is of lowly estate, I can rejoice in that Christ lifts me up as I am a part of his body. If I'm of, uh, of a wealthy class, well, then I need to rejoice in my humility because I realize that wealth doesn't matter. What matters is heaven. And we hope that today that's exactly what you've seen that what matters in life is ultimately, ultimately it is heaven. Look at trials as a means of preparing you to be full grown in Christ and to go to heaven. Realize that your life was changed when you put on Jesus in penitent baptism. If you've gone back into sin, know that you can come back to him again in confessing and ask him for the prayers of the saints. Whatever your need, don't hesitate. Call on us. We'll be glad to help so that you can know the blessings in trials. What can wash away my sin? Nothing but the blood.
Let's pray together. Our Father in heaven, we give you thanks and praise for all that you have done for us. We thank you, Father, for the splendor of this whole creation, for the beauty of this world, and for the wonders of this life. We thank you, Father, for the blessings of our church family and for us individually, for the loving care you surround us with on every side. We thank you, Father, for being with us always, especially, Father, in our times of despair and trouble. We acknowledge our dependence upon you, Father, and we acknowledge our shortcomings, and we pray that you would forgive us of those things. We pray, Father, for our elders as they look to you for guidance. Help us all, Father, to lift them up in prayer every day that you may guide them with your word. We are so blessed here, Father, with dedicated ministers. We ask that you continue to bless them, their families, <clears throat> and their work at this place. Father, we have many who are struggling with sickness and loss. You know their needs, Father. We pray that you will lay your healing hand upon them and strengthen them and comfort them as only you can. Father, we are mindful of the doctors and nurses around this world who are working tirelessly to save lives <clears throat> for those who are affected by this pandemic. Lord, please give them strength and energy to fight this virus. And Father, above all, we give thanks for your Son and our Savior, Jesus Christ. We know, Father, that his life teaches us so much and gives us an example of how we ought to live our life. Help us to be steadfast, Father, in that obedience. We pray, Father, that you will grant us a worthy walk, that we may bring honor to your holy name. Continue to be with us always, Father. In Christ's name we pray. Amen.